This episode of Crowd Scene was recorded back when the show was called Kickstars. So every time you hear the words Kickstars, think Crowd Scene. You can now find us at crowdsceneshow.com and also follow us on Twitter at crowdsceneshow. Thanks for listening. Kickstars. In this episode, we meet Matt Hill of the Media Podcast, the UK's leading podcast on media news, and he shares his tips and explains why his crowdfunding campaign was different than most. And I think we had to say, you know, isn't it a shame this could end? You can save it. You have the power in you to do that, which is a different message to, I think, to a lot of Kickstarter campaigns, which is like, listen, this isn't a brilliant brand new idea. Let's make it happen together, which is very like, yes, we can. Whereas ours is like, save our souls. Kickstarters, gonna kick it with Pete and Mike. Kickstarters, interviews behind the hype. Kickstarters. Hi there. Hello. Welcome to Kickstarters, the show about successful crowdfunding campaigns and the people who make them happen. I'm Michael Ogden. And I'm Peter Dean. In each episode of Kickstarters, we speak with people who have taken a risk by turning an idea of theirs into reality, by raising money on a crowdfunding platform. But what did it take to reach their goal? I like to hear the story behind the idea, where it took them, and hear from them what it meant to find success. And I want to know how you design and build a successful campaign, and what our guests learned along the way. We're going to dig into some of the factors that can make or break a campaign. So in this episode, it's award-winning producer Matt Hill. We'll be hearing about his successful Kickstarter project of last year to make a show called The Media Podcast, which was previously a show called Media Talk. That's right, yeah. It was a Guardian show, and then uh, I took it on. All right. Upcoming, we're going to hear the whole story from Matt Hill, uh, how he did that, took it on, and made it a uh, successful campaign. So in order to get the show up and running for 12 months, you wanted to raise £9,000 on Kickstarter. So that's uh, in uh, US parlance, that's about uh, $14,000. You ended up beating that goal by just like 93 quid. You just squeezed by. A dramatic finish. Yeah. Let's set the scene for our listeners who aren't familiar with your project. How would you describe your campaign? Okay. So the Guardian Media Talk podcast has was uh, a staple of their, uh, their initial audio output. There was about two or three they started with back in 2006. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was one of the first podcasts I listened to, actually. Um, so you started as a, as a fan? I started as a fan, mm-hmm. and in the kind of the, the larger scope of becoming a radio producer, I ended up doing a bit of work for The Guardian, working on other things. I'm still a freelance audio producer now, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the Media Talk program kind of needed a producer at some point, and I stepped into the breach uh, mm-hmm. to help out there. And um, after a, a couple of years on that, there was a bit of a shake up of all the audio on uh, that site. Mm-hmm. And uh, they looked at some of the uh, sort of like the lower uh, rating shows, as in like the amount of listeners going. Mm-hmm. And they looked at uh, Media Talk and they went, yeah, we could probably do without it as a, as a weekly feature. Mm-hmm. So um, was it seen uh, as too niche? Yeah, it was. Although I think uh, the Guardian now recognise that that niche is still quite important. Yes, uh, Media Guardian as a brand is still like one of the most respected in the UK, yes. and I think and growing internationally. Yeah, absolutely. As as the Guardian is in the US and Australia and English speaking mm-hmm. uh, countries, I think. Uh, they kind of realized that they they still needed a multimedia output. Uh, And more importantly, the listenership, they needed this kind of weekly fix. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so uh, they got in touch. They firstly comments on the site and then they contacted me and they wanted what we were going to do about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the next question I asked was, what am I going to do about it? Were you surprised um, by that kind of groundswell of support? I was. I, well, I, I knew it was big because as a, as a listener, I was disappointed to see it go. And um, I really wanted to do something with it. And I didn't want to be the producer that killed Media Talk. So <laughs> uh, there was a kind of like a bit of a fight for my reputation as well. And so, so, so at, what, at that point, what was the audience? How, how big was the audience of the show? It was a fair amount of very influential decision makers within, you know, when we go out uh, to events, when we went to award ceremonies, when we went to conferences, we'd speak to very high power execs at uh, the BBC, ITV, mm-hmm. uh, BuzzFeed and mm-hmm. places like that who all listen to the program. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that kind of influence, uh, you, you know, you can't just start from scratch. Mm-hmm. And so I was very keen to keep that. What is essentially, as you guys know, as you have mm-hmm. a, a podcast of your own, this mm-hmm. is going to eat itself very quickly, I feel, as a, as a program, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, an RSS feed, the equivalent of a mailing list. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, that feed is so important because it's a direct 
hook into uh, the ears of so many really important media managers in the country. So mm. I thought, well, we had to do something with this. And there's a groundswell of support. Uh, but what should we do? Was there a moment, though, where you took your, you, you said to the team, looks like that's it. Let's go have some leaving drinks and wrap up and, and say, you know, we tried. There wasn't really time to think because before, I mean, as is as often the way with, with these uh, kind of media projects, uh, by the time it, it was announced, someone had been in touch to say, you should, you should crowdfund this. You can make it happen. I'd pay to listen to uh, media talk uh, outside the Guardian. My my attitude going into the uh, the media podcast crowdfunding campaign was: it is all or nothing. Either this gets funded, or we can't afford to make it because it, it is kind of a real investment uh, every mm-hmm. week. You know, not just to book the guests, but to do the research, to do the you know, there's a, and a, some of it. Most of the program is reactive. We talk about the week's news. Yeah, but the uh, there is scope for original journalism and that's where i think we did really well was getting those kind of different interviews that the the rest of the press weren't doing Mm -hmm. so uh to try and keep those going we needed some listener support so so tell us about the the name the media podcast where did that come from and uh do you are you proud of it as a name i am uh i have instant regret for the the title (laughs) uh, the media podcast i was going through a stage at the time of thinking let's keep it simple Hmm. Like, simple is good. Well, my, simple my, my question, is good. My question However, sounded mean. Was it, are you proud of it? <laughs> no, no. I, the, ti- the title I'm not so proud of. And the reason is basically summed up in three letters. S-E-O. Mm, uh, yes. And, you know, you type media and podcast in, you will get... And it took yes. maybe maybe six, seven weeks for us to start getting into the first rank, page rankings uh, because of the other podcasts. Yes. And it didn't, they didn't necessarily have to be about media because they tag the word media in them. And so we had to tinker around. We, we, we included the presenter's name, who has a, a lot of traction online, mm-hmm. Ollie Mann. Mm-hmm. He has another podcast, which is very popular. So mm-hmm. it, that kind of linked everything up a little bit more. But if you are looking for our podcast, can I just say, The Media Podcast, all one word, will get you there. It will get you there. TheMediaPodcast.com. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that is a question of uh, picking a good title. So there we go. Point learning <laughs> yeah. number one. When you're creating a podcast... Be distinctive. So can I ask you, with, um, with the campaigns, you, you chose Kickstarter because it was all or nothing? Yeah, because uh, I think philosophically, we only wanted to carry on with the blessing of the listeners. Right. And if there weren't enough listeners willing to stump up, remember mm-hmm. we'd had an email mm-hmm. very early on saying, I'd be happy to pay for this. Yes. That's mm-hmm. all very well, but they're not going to bankroll the whole program. Yes. You need several hundred people to be saying that in order to make it happen and put their money where their mouth is. So it started really as a kind of, well, let's... We'll show them. Let's test it. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's see if they let's see if that's true. Um, and so we set up six free episodes. Okay. We did one the, immediately the week that the media talk program ended. Mm-hmm. We started a new one, so that when we handed over and said you can, you know, a new podcast is starting, you can subscribe to that. That was then up and running. Yeah. And then uh, after that first episode. I think we just did one for free, exactly the same, just to prove we could do it mm-hmm. and that it would be the same. And then in week two, we launched the Kickstarter and said, we have 28 days to raise the money. Otherwise, this glorious experiment will be over very shortly. The ticking clock. Yeah. And I think that le- level of jeopardy, like here's what you could have won, mm-hmm. I think kind of allowed us, allowed people to realize that we meant it. That mm-hmm. this was, for all the, uh, for all the uh, joy we were giving people, there was a... Thinly veiled threat. You said, something, you said something interesting earlier about um, feeling like you didn't want to be the one who, who failed the show um, with media talk. I mean, how much of the campaign as you're deciding to go for it felt like a personal quest? How much was it a personal quest? My aim was really to slink into the background as soon as possible. I was quite reluctant to have, to kind of front it as my, as I save the podcast or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And, but it, it was more a sort of a sort of slightly more internal thought of I don't want to have this on my CV because I previous to this I when I very first started in the radio industry my first gig was at Channel Four which isn't a radio station it's a TV station but they were going to launch a whole bunch of radio stations and uh, it was a graduate position worked on it for six months and in week, and month four they said we're pulling the plug on the entire thing so my first job <laughs> was effectively 
a disaster in terms of like, you know, it was a very well publicized media disaster. <laughs> and so I would go to people and I'd say, you know, I've worked for this company and all this business. And they say, oh, you, where were you at? You were at Channel 4. I said, yeah, you were at Channel 4. Oh, what a shame. Mm. So people's kind oh, of feeling man. towards you was always one of pity. Yes. <laughs> I sort of didn't want to be involved in any more pity. Yes. So, uh, so had spent several years building up a reputation for making high quality podcasts and, and, uh, and documentaries. And I didn't necessarily want another little Channel 4 on my CV. No, you wanted a win. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, so I was gunning for it. You initially said it wasn't really a personal thing, but actually it was very personal in a way. Well, that's my drive. That's yeah. not necessarily... Uh, and, and how people see you, I suppose, you just want to be... You want, from a professional reputational situation, you, you want to be in control of that. Yeah, but you totally turned it around. I um, was speaking with someone uh, a previous episode where they, they were saying with a campaign... It's either the it's either personal or it's the product you know that people are buying into. Yeah, and in a way, a lot of these Kickstarter campaigns or Indiegogo, there's so much to do with the video um, because people are buying into that presentation. And well, actually, one interesting thing about your campaign is that there's no video. You've, Correct. It's like it's it's such a minimal campaign page. It was uh, it was very much stripped back. Well, so here's here's the thing: there was a video. It was shot a few little bits in a in a, the studio we were recording in, which was. Uh, it was a proper studio, but it was very. It was quite a small, pokey room for a studio, um, and stu- radio studios. I mean, present company ex- accepted are pretty like you know unimpressive places. Yeah. So you <laughs> you, you don't really <laughs> you don't you don't get any natural light a lot of the time. Yeah, suits me fine for my hay fever in the summer. <laughs> but generally speaking, they they they're kind of like they're not impressive on on uh, video. So we ch- shot that put it together and before i sent it out i sent it to a few people who i know who kind of like are you know i, I just kind of value their opinion mm-hmm. and within about five minutes one of them had got back to me and said mate don't don't oh. put this out oh dear don't put it out it does not look good and i think the reason <laughs> is partly because it was shot on the ipad so it didn't cut together very mm-hmm. well yeah. uh partly it's because like you know it's an office yeah you know, an office doesn't look like an office it looks like yeah so where someone works yeah. you know it's yeah. it doesn't it's not your kind of tv idea of what an office looks like it's yeah. actually a working place which is a bit messy yeah. or maybe not was, inspiring I, I tied it up but never, <laughs> nevertheless composition you know i'm a radio producer not like a, a video director so that kind of self-shooting thing it, it would work for it works for projects mm-hmm. which are uh sort of bedroom projects in the sense of you know that they're, they're made mm-hmm. at home and uh they, mm-hmm. they, they there's a kind of like a grassroots mm-hmm. feel to them but we were making a program which was going out to the media professionals yes it was going out to tv as, people to tell it to yeah. tv people people who really value good yeah. composition powerful good. people yeah exactly and you don't want to make it look as though you've gone from a guardian product with this kind of shiny sleek building in yeah. uh, king's cross to something which is you know sort of being made from someone's bedroom which yeah Obviously, it was not where it was being done. It was being done in professional studios. So um, it kind of, uh, the video thing, in the time we had, we just elected it in the end to, uh, to focus our efforts on the podcast, the high quality product. Mm-hmm. And that was the difference is, you know, Kickstart is all about video because video and visuals sell. Mm-hmm. But because we had an audience that really loved the podcast, we just elected to mm-hmm. post as part of our updates a podcast a week and mm-hmm. that would sell the show okay so how long was it but how long was there between the idea of doing a kickstarter and getting the project live i knew that the the media talk was finishing before we announced it so i had a little bit of time mm-hmm. and was kind of talking behind the scenes about what what we should do when it went public and people started emailing us i knew that we had a chance um and then we basically had another week to plan find a studio get that first podcast recorded and at the same time set up the Kickstarter so that it would go live. Uh, and obviously, you know, all the other things you need to kind of do if you're setting up anything really, which is Twitter account, Facebook yeah. page, and, you know, everything which is branded nicely so it all works out. Come up with a name. So that all, <laughs> yeah, of those, all of those things make well, sense. That's five, six minutes. <laughs> yeah. So the, so the actual Kickstarter, uh, we, we kind of put the first iteration of that up. Maybe it, that took like two or three days of just writing and rewriting. Yeah. Um, and then making a video and then not putting it on and, you know, testing it out before we put it, we published it. Um, but it had to be quite slick because there was a momentum behind mm-hmm. it. And if we didn't, 
if we didn't capture that momentum, right. then people would stop listening and the whole thing would disappear. But, you know, radio is a ve- radio and podcasts, even podcasts, are habit forming. Mm. You either listen at the same time every week or you, or you find something else to fill the time. Yeah. So people listen when they're running, when they're cleaning the car, when they're uh, commuting, and they'll just find something else. So we had to be there at the same time, mm. released on the same day, to make sure that people were listening. So from the perspective of the audience, and I think you were just saying this, uh, the, the show was, was unbroken. It was every week, and it continued to be every week, even though The Guardian had disowned it. You put these six shows together independently, and you put together, put together your whole Kickstarter campaign in one week. Yes. Yeah. Is that right? Well, we put the, put the whole uh, page together. Mm-hmm. We, had to, we set it for 28 days. Yeah. But like, yeah, it, but it in was, terms uh, of the pre-launch, it was yeah, weeks absolutely. It was rather than quick. months. Or, oh my! Yeah. So my we have word, talked yeah, to people yeah, yeah. who have, who have uh, spent months putting together course, their campaigns. Yeah, yeah. I, I imagine yeah. they raised a lot more money. <laughs> 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 but we had a very definite uh, idea of uh, what we needed to raise and how long we needed to do it, and we knew that we, we, what we had was. Um, a inbuilt audience. Mm-hmm. This isn't like a project starting from scratch. This right. is taking a series of, uh, like you know, people who are already invested in a product yeah. and saying, "Will you back it to the next to its to its next generation to its next iteration?" Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, so we didn't have to do that kind of planning. We had to take. We had to transfer the audience that already existed. Yeah. We didn't. We didn't try and win over anyone new. Okay. We just wanted to gun for the people that already existed that we knew existed and loved it. So and get knew, them to pay. You knew that if a per- enough of a percentage of your existing base of listeners contributed, you'd be okay. Yeah, exactly. And I knew that that was going to be a very low amount because there are a lot of people who say they'll miss something, yeah. but a very few amount that will actually, you know, go to a website, put in their card details and pay uh, the yes. right amount of money to make that happen. Um, uh, which, uh, you know, I've spoken to people before, um, uh, ironically, after we'd done the Kickstarter, <laughs> who said it was about like 2 3% of your audience will actually stump up. Uh, ours was more than that. Yeah. We had a better average. Yeah. But, it, but you know, that gives you, an, that gives you an idea of yes. like how many people you have to reach in order to get anyone to pay. So mm. was there a reason why you didn't take it, see it as an opportunity of let's go beyond our base and spread the word? Yeah, I think partly because our campaign was run on a kind of save the podcast. And of course, that is a complex message to put out because it suggests, firstly, you know what a podcast is. Yes. And I think something that all podcasters have a problem with is having to explain to people what the medium is before they sell the show that they're trying to give you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there was that to deal with. First, the second thing is that, you know, it's like, well, what, why does it need being, why does it need to be saved? Yeah. And we didn't necessarily want to be in a position where, again, back to the pity, where we were essentially saying the Guardian cancelled it, help us mm. to people who didn't have hadn't heard it in the first place. Because your initial reaction to that would be, well, it's probably a reason why it went. Right. So you want to basically gun straight for the people who listened, mm-hmm. who said, "This is what we want. We want to keep this yes. in some way." And, and, we it would, need and it you. wouldn't take much. It wouldn't take much to make it happen. There's a very uh, British stiff upper lip. Uh, quality to this kind of uh, your, your idea of like not, make, not wanting to make a fuss of it but at the same time wanting to keep it going yeah i it's interesting you bring nationality into it because of course in america like uh where crowdfunding really is like a, a viable way of getting something made uh there are plenty of podcasts which have crowdfunded and done very well out of it and we were inspired by this and i'm sure we'll talk about it in a bit mm-hmm. but and we have listeners in the states mm-hmm. and i think disproportionately more americans paid for what is essentially a UK industry podcast. Mm -hmm. Some of them expats, you know, people Mm -hmm. living out there who want to keep their ear to the ground of the UK scene. Mm -hmm. But they were paying out more than your, your, your kind of your British listeners. Um, (laughs) And, you know, whilst, uh, you know, I'm just very happy that we have a listenership Mm -hmm. and they want to listen. I, there is a kind of slight reluctance. I mean, it's a a frustration that um, we don't have a culture of that in Mm -hmm. Britain. And so, yeah, I think partly our messaging was about, you know, saying to the Brits, you know, yeah, we're the underdogs in this. Yeah. You know, trying to channel something of the kind of bulldog spirit. I think as a nationality, we just tend to get less excited about things and, or we, we, we bottle it up inside rather than, uh, 
outwardly declare it in places like Kickstarter and you know, put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, and I think we had to say, you know, isn't it a shame this could end? Mm. You can save it. You have the power in you to do that. Yeah. Um, which is a different message to, I think, to a lot of Kickstarter mm-hmm. campaigns, which is like, let's make this happen. Isn't this an amazing, isn't this isn't a brilliant brand new idea? Yeah. Let's make it happen together. Yeah. Which is very like, yes, we can. Yes. Whereas ours is like, uh, you know, save our souls. You yes. know, that's that kind of like, uh, that's, that was the kind of the way we were, we were aiming at because we wanted an urgency. We wanted to make it, make it happen this once, you know, we weren't expecting, in fact, we're not expecting to go back again with another Kickstarter. Ah. We wanted to do a, like a one, like real push for the audience to make it happen. And then we, we could basically take over from there. So this, uh, I want to say season, but it's, you're, it's a year that you've crowdfunded uh, yeah. for the campaign. So that's 25 episodes. It comes out every two weeks. Yeah. Um, and there's no talk of, all right, once we do these 25, let's go back to Kickstarter. Basically, yes. I don't think, uh, particularly Kickstarter. We, I'm kind of leaving the door open for listener contributions, mm-hmm. not as a dependency. Because what I, I kind of believe, and maybe this is part of my culture as well i kind of feel like you do deserve to get something back Mm -hmm. and one of the things that came out of the kickstarter campaign which i really enjoyed was um i i like listener contributions not just in terms of financial Mm -hmm. which were very happy Mm -hmm. at the time but also in terms of like uh, creativity Mm -hmm. and one of the things we asked for is really simple but was that you know if you if you gave up to if you gave 25 pound or more you would get a dedication in the show yes um and we didn't make much of it at the time, but after the show, we, I, when we were doing the feeding, sending out the surveys, I asked them to just give, them a, give us a little pithy line about what you do. Mm-hmm. Partly, I was thinking, well, that'd be interesting for our, you know, to get, get a sense of the audience. Mm-hmm. But what was nice was to include that in the dedication mm. on air. Yes. And I've had several people come up to me uh, about the show and said, one of the most fascinating bits is finding out who else listens, yeah. getting a sense of the audience. And the audience themselves, you know, were the professors of journalism. They were actual journalists. They were drone operators. Mm-hmm. They were uh, like uh, jingle writers. They were voiceover artists. And it's just this huge, you know, it gives you a real scope of the industry. Not incl- You know, obviously there were students as well, media mm-hmm. students. People who'd studied media mm. had then gone into completely different careers, but still kind of dipped their toe in the water with this, this one podcast every week or fortnight. And so... It started, it's just started to build a kind of an idea of a community. Mm-hmm. And I think the Kickstarter campaign did that. It kind of, it galvanized the listenership to kind of wonder who they were as a person and who everyone else was that were listening. Yes. And wouldn't it be know? fantastic to get all those people in a room, in a tent, yeah. you know, and to go, all right, now mingle. Well, there is a question of like, what else do you, once, once you've got that, what do you do with it? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of part two. And I, that's something we're trying to build now is like, wh- what do we do with this kind of groundswell? I mean, mm. there are people who have funded us who are, who are clearly really invested in what we yeah. do. Uh, and then there's the wider listenership. And do we want to try and include more in that? Not necessarily in a financial contribution way, but maybe mm. there's a, a kind of a, a membership or something that we can, we can build out of that. And, and so things like we had a members website, which mm-hmm. you could listen to more content, you know, sort of extended interviews and mm-hmm. stuff. And we're wondering what to do with all of that information and content now and, and those people. And of course, the, the other thing that happened was because we could highlight the kind of people who were listening uh, and contributing, actually willing to stump up the cash. So they were, they were genuinely listening. One of the problems with podcasting, again, is that you wouldn't necessarily know just from downloads how long people were listening for, whether they were listening to the end. Yeah. Uh, and so we had this very tight uh, knit group of people who must be listening because they're paying money to listen. So we could take that group, say these are genuinely people who are listening and are opinion formers Mm -hmm. and are um, great uh, to advertise to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'd originally gone to people and said, would you be interested in helping do the podcast, you know, sort of save it, finance it. And they'd kind of um, denied about it. Once we'd done the Kickstarter, Mm -hmm. those same companies came back and said, yeah, we'll, we'll sponsor you. So once we'd done the Kickstarter, we found that companies were more willing to talk to us. There's a validation that you had mm. people out there listening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're going to take a short break in a second, but before we get to that break, um, just one last question. Before you uh, went live with your campaign, at that point, did you have any big concerns or worries before you pressed go? I suppose 
in the philosophy of Kickstarter, it was all or nothing. Like this was like, you know, to the moon or bust. Yeah. Either we were going to make it and it was going to be, uh, and it was going to be glorious or it was going to be a spectacular, and I enjoy the word spectacular, failure. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> Good line. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a short break here. Uh, when we come back, we're going to hear what happened as Matt's campaign went live. This episode is sponsored by Syndicate Room, an equity crowdfunding platform in the UK. So what does that mean? Well, in exchange for your money, you receive equity in a business. Syndicate Room is an investor-led platform. So when you invest in a company on Syndicate Room, you're doing so alongside sophisticated investors. These are highly experienced business angels. They look at these early stage businesses, they carry out their due diligence, they value the companies, and they invest their own money. Only then does a business meet the criteria necessary and the investment is opened up to the crowd. So the crowd can invest side by side with these experienced investors. And what's the best part? You get the very same deal on the same economic terms. So visit syndicateroom.com to see the current range of opportunities so that you too can invest with the angels. Please remember that investing in early stage businesses is risky and Syndicate Room is targeted at sophisticated investors that make their own investment decisions and understand these risks. So check it out at syndicateroom.com. Okay, so we're here talking with award-winning producer Matt Hill. Uh, Matt, can you describe that moment when you realized the campaign was actually going to be successful? Yeah, it was called once it had finished. I think there was like a... <laughs> only I, I, when it was finished. Only, I think really? it, was, it was only the last couple of hours where we thought, oh, okay, that this close. is going to happen. Oh, yeah, it was really close. I think, it, what was it? It was uh, £93 pounds over mm. the uh, our aim. And that, that could have gone either way. But, but also it was the, um, the fact that we needed to kind of rally the troops at the end yeah. and just get that last cash injection in. Well, talk but, us through, I mean, when you, you go live... Did it feel like, wow, this is a heady first day, you know, first couple of days flush with victory? Yeah, I think so. Uh, myself and uh, Peter Price, the exec, had kind of sat down and tried to work out r- what kind of the graph of emotion that we'd go through during <laughs> the Kickstarter campaign. And we thought, okay, well, we'll start on a high. We'll, we'll launch. Mm. We'll get that first wave of donations. We'll feel really good. Yeah. And we'll make that second podcast because we'd done one just before we'd launched. Right. Uh, and and then we'll uh, we'll do that, and uh, and then it'll kind of it'll start to drop off a little bit, and then uh, there'll be a bit of a mid midway peak again as we kind of get to the halfway point, and uh, we'll realise that we're still under halfway towards our funding goal, which is also again true. Mm. Uh, and then we'll have another kind of lull, and that will get very low, mm-hmm. and then we'll have a, a kind of clamour at the end, and it will be messy and chaotic and glorious and hopefully spectacular. Uh, when we succeed but ultimately and, and that was basically the graph of success so I mean, you were right our predictions yeah. were pretty I'd, I'd look back on that now and i think yeah we were pretty spot on as you go through the graph of course you forget about it you you kind of as you experience it you're like oh we're never gonna get out of this yeah. and i think it was you know that first we got about the first two grand was easy mm-hmm. you know we were aiming for nine mm-hmm. the first t- the first two came in the first week and we were very happy mm-hmm. uh, and then it started to like you know we get the drips and drabs mm-hmm. you know um and and uh, and we started to kind of feel a little bit like well what do we do now and what did you do well we had a look at the perks and we worked out what what we needed to do and of course feedback was coming in by this point mm-hmm. you know sort of like i really like what you're doing you know people have started talking about why are you doing kickstarter why aren't you doing something like patreon mm-hmm. um <laughs> that's useful advice in the middle of a campaign. Yeah, in the middle of a campaign. But, yeah. but I, you know, and I've looked at Patreon subsequent. You know, I'd looked at that, actually. Mm. I'd looked at Patreon before, mm. um, and I'd looked at Indiegogo, mm-hmm. and we'd made this decision that it was all or nothing. Yeah. Like, there, was no, there was no middle ground because we didn't want to underfund a show. Yeah. It could only work on the amount it has and no more or no less. So, um, so we'd gone into it with that kind of uh, frame of mind. Um, but other feedback was, uh, was uh, the right time, right place. And that was, you know, sort of like suggestions on the kinds of um, perks, you know, people could people get. And I'd, we'd done some pretty simple ones. We'd done the, the dedication came in pretty early. I was quite reluctant to do, because of the, um, the iPhone app experience where we'd done T-shirts and badges. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was just a bit of a thankless task to actually produce yeah. and mm. sucked money out. I was very keen to do things which cost, which had no material cost. Yeah. Um, I didn't mind putting effort in, sure. but I didn't want to be creating lots of things which would take money away from yes. the from the podcast. There were quite a few unusual perks that I saw on the campaign. Yeah, we and um, we tried really hard to be inventive 
you know things things that i that still tickle me now are like picnic with ollie man you know where you get to have a, a lovely I day in that, the park but no ollie. one bought that no one bought it <laughs> still tickles did, did me he, even now did he ever go on a picnic alone <laughs> no we didn't force oh. him to do it no no that <laughs> okay. was that was uh no that was completely but we we did do some uh tours of broadcasting house um mm. Uh, which were slightly um, under the radar. They were going kind to, of, you know, I <laughs> sneak again, someone in. I'm give again them a badge reluctant. And... <laughs> to, I'm reluctant to talk too much about that because obviously <laughs> it was all a bit informal. Do you ever feel like anyone saying ah, podcasts? They're free. Why do I need to pay for these? No, I think I think actually that w- that would have been a problem, uh, particularly for a British audience, had we not been trying to sa- sa- you know save the podcast mm-hmm. if there wasn't something that was already existing that you could actually put a, an amount of money towards mm-hmm. i mean we were, we uh, continue to operate on a very uh sort of very commercial uh strip to the bone production you mm-hmm. know it, it is it is the quality it is uh through due diligence and putting on a bit of extra effort mm-hmm. but it works on a very small amount of money per episode mm-hmm. and uh and that's we were we were totally honest with our audience, saying this is how much it would cost to make twenty six episodes. No messing about. Can we can we hit that figure? So, how big was your team on the Kickstarter campaign, and how big is the, the team on making the show? Uh, it was the same team. So it was myself producing. It was a presenter, Ollie, and it was the uh, exec, Peter Price, mm-hmm. and that was it. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so three of us. So at that point with the panic of like, okay, this is beginning to the trickle in as opposed to the deluge, did you do something that G'd up the troops? Well, we, we had two things. Um, firstly, the, we started to sh- sort out the perks, come up with some new ones. Um, the, things like the tour came out of that. Mm-hmm. Basically, someone had told us, uh, listen, your perks, you start at £25, which is fine. Uh, it was um, it was something tangible, but you could have a perk lower than that, which would just bring people up. Because I see you've got a few people who have donated a pound or five mm-hmm. pounds. Mm-hmm. We've been saying on air, anything will do. So we can't be ungrateful at people mm-hmm. who are donating a pound. Yeah. But um, if you start your perks at ten pounds with something which actually you don't have to deliver, something just puts a smile on their face. Mm-hmm. So in the end, we our first perk was a warm feeling in your gut. Yes, nice. <laughs> and for ten pounds. For ten pounds, yeah. yeah. And it's true, you will get a warm feeling in your gut when you donate ten pounds to save the media podcast. Yeah. So there was a was it a way for them to participate? It was a way for them to participate. It was uh, they felt like they were getting rewarded. It was kind of like just rubber stamping their uh, their donation and, and giving them an indication. Mm-hmm. And I've spoken to people since uh, street performers mm-hmm. who talk about how they hustle, not hustle how they finally get the money out of people. It's about aiming higher than you need. Mm-hmm. And then people will just artificially inflate their, their expectation of what they're going to give. Right. You know, they'll joke at 50 pounds, you know, yes. on a str- you must've seen them in Covent Garden. Yes. You know, when they say, you know, we do accept folding yes. or whatever. Yes. And it does make you suddenly go from giving like, you know, I, I'm imagining other people now, but yeah. like, you know, giving from 50 P up to a two pound coin from a five pound to a ten pound, it just inflates your yes, uh, your expectations a little bit, and that yeah. that really helps. And a little sense of humor always helps grease yeah. the wheels. There was a guy in Washington D.C., um, a homeless guy who would walk around with a jar of peanut butter, um, and he would uh, uh, say, "I just need some celery or, or something to dip this, you know, dip in this peanut butter." Did anybody have any celery? Wow! And people would kind of laugh and engage with this guy, and of course, no one had celery on them, but they did have a dollar or five dollars, and the guy. Maybe. Dip. He dipped the money in the peanut no. butter. <laughs> <laughs> that would be rather strange. That's it. No, very, very smart thinking. Yeah, yeah. he was a successful um, homeless man. Um, <laughs> That's a lovely story. <laughs> One of the more successful, <laughs> <laughs> successful homeless with a jar of peanut butter. Obviously, you, you very much brought your own audience to the Kickstarter campaign. But did you? find that you picked up, uh, did your audience get a boost as a result of being on Kickstarter? Did you find new listeners? Well, yes. However, that was partly down to the reputation of the programme within the industry. So once, I mean, there's nothing the media likes talking about more than itself. (laughs) So what happened was once the show was announced as being axed, that was one story that went out into uh, a few other papers so the independent picked it up the evening standard and they just ran something in their media diary um and then the next story that came out was that the producer had gone rogue 
effectively. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they kind of they beefed it up a little bit. They yeah. they they tried to uh, make it sound a little bit more uh, spectacular. Than it was. You stole the show. So then another column came out saying that this Kickstarter had been done, and of course, you know, all the rivals were like, "Well, wouldn't it be funny?" You know, that's the way they think. Wouldn't it be funny if we if we uh, got the funding? So then, obviously, they that that's what they wrote effectively. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so that made it much easier mm. to get that kind of coverage, and you know that feeding those columns back to the people that had funded people, mm. and also the people who are listening, because of course we're not just communicating with people through the Kickstarter; we're talking to them directly through the podcast. Right. Yes. And so we'd have a spot. We'd do the normal show, and we'd have a spot in the middle of the program where I would do the hard sell, and it, that ended up being me because I didn't want to have our presenter kind of capping hand cap in hand to the uh, audience, so. Um, I did a spot for uh, 40 seconds talking about how we, how far we'd done. We'd, we'd say, go have a look at the articles online. Mm-hmm. The Independents run it, read something quite funny about mm-hmm. us, you know, or, uh, um, you know, we've hit a new milestone, we're halfway there, mm-hmm. or we've hit 200, you know, uh, donors or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, those kind of things on the podcast as well as in text form on, yeah. the, on the thing. And it just, I think it made the listeners feel like they they could donate. Yes. And those, those donations never stopped. They may have dipped a little bit in the middle of the campaign, mm-hmm. but they never stopped. People, every episode, every time we released an episode, another wave of donations would come in. Mm-hmm. And it was just about kept banging on, basically, until mm-hmm. everyone had done it. And during those spots, were you calling out people who had donated to the campaign? Hadn't or had? Had. Uh, (laughs) Hadn't would be a bit brutal. Because there's a list. Yeah, we're waiting for uh, Jerry Johnson to... Uh, do you know what? I don't think we did. I because we were we were doing these dedications. I think uh, if people don't, if people did that dedications thing, we did that within the podcast. I can't remember if we started doing that during the campaign or not, though. Right. But good idea. Good idea. Next Might time. Do that. Next yeah. time. <laughs> no, next time. I can see that working. I was going to say I'd, I'd like to play that clip if we can. Is that a good time to do this? Yes, let's do that. Let's just. I want to get your reaction to this, Matt. Um, Cast you your to... mind back to a young Matt Hill. Hello, producer Matt here with one final message about our crowdfunding campaign. Our target is £9,000 to bring you a year of programmes. We're currently at around £3,500, so that gives us until Friday, less than a week, to raise just over £5,000. Otherwise, there will be no more editions of the media podcast. How are you feeling uh, on that day? Well... We knew this would happen. We knew that we knew in the graph this is where we'd be. In, I mean, we hadn't put on our x y axis on our you know we hadn't put numbers in. So you'd physically we, made a graph. You oh had, yeah, we yeah, it yeah, was yeah. On but paper. we but we knew <laughs> but we knew that we would not be even half of the way that we needed to be in order to to really do it. And we knew there'd be panic. But isn't that the point of all of this? Is like to the threat. So we knew that was happening. Um, and so I'd gone into that recording basically going, we'll give them the hard sell mm. um, and we'll see where we can go. Yeah. But at the same time as we were doing that, we were also going back to those sponsors and saying, look at the, look at the people that have donated. Mm-hmm. Now, look, you could save this podcast mm. if you made one donation mm-hmm. into that Kickstarter. You know, and, uh, and you would get a kind of almost saviour of the pod kind of press release afterwards as well. So yeah. there's, there's a lot riding on that. So. And I'd I'd um, seen you know things like not the same but things like that happen on other Kickstarter campaigns where businesses would agree to like you know if you hit a certain amount of donors then they would match fund those donors or whatever and I just thought well you know if you can just phrase it right then it won't sound like you know oh you were going to do that anyway or mm-hmm. whatever if you can just find a way of saying look. If you can get us so far, they'll mm-hmm. meet us the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. And that's what we try to engineer in that last... And it was a frantic last week. Mm. You know, we were looking to try and raise... You know, we, we thought, you know, if we could raise three... You know, we could probably raise three grand off a sponsor at that point mm-hmm. to take us over the edge or something like that. You know, if we mm-hmm. can get something like that in, mm-hmm. then uh, without selling the whole podcast, you mm-hmm. know, to to one company as well, because we still wanted to... Mm-hmm. We're main... We This is newly won independence we didn't want to completely give it away by moving wholesale to another company mm-hmm. so um so we wanted to try and maintain that and uh, so we were trying to find those those uh warm voices at the mm-hmm. same time and uh, you know obviously 
we had contributors to the program, people from mm-hmm. uh, you know different parts of the industry who worked for companies who might be able to help us out uh, and put us in cut touch with people who could help. So we're talking to all those people at the same time, was that, as well as doing the Kickstarter. Was that the toughest week of your campaign? Oh yeah, absolutely. But with that kind of, you know, when you work in a industry which is always down to the wire, where the deadlines are, you know, you're coming on after the news or, mm. you know, and there's just chaos all around and then the, the light goes on. Yeah. And then you're meant to be as calm as anything, as you know, <laughs> and everything's going to be fine. That that is kind of almost like default position. So there was a sort of serenity about mm. about it. But you, I mean, certainly it was chaos. Like around us, it was up. You know, it was like, how, how are we going to do it? I don't think you're going to do it. I don't know. And so you know, people didn't think we'd make it. Um, Did you think you were going to make it? Uh, yes, I think there was a point about three or four days before where I think we just, we knew we had like the weekend left. The major problem for us really was uh, we had a a great sponsor who came on board Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, yep, we're going to fund this. But the, because it was coming up to the weekend, you know, it was just the sheer, the sheer logistics Mm -hmm. of getting the money off them into kicks. Because of course, Kickstarter will only do what it, it won't wait for you. Mm-hmm. Like say, oh, well, the money's coming. Mm-hmm. You've got to have the money there. Yeah. So it's like, can we get the money before the weekend? Oh, our finance manager's on holiday and it might have to be till Monday. And it's like, well, that's going to cut it a bit fine because I think we're, it has to be by midday or whatever. I can't yeah. remember how it all worked. But, you know, we had to get something. So we, we had to kind of basically sort out some cash flow in order for that, in order for them to pay us back. And that was the trickiest bit really was, Making sure that we definitely hit that 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 deadline in the end, uh, without having to uh, to like you know lose so you, all the money. So you actually topped it up yourselves with the knowledge that they would pay you back. There was kind of an agreement, yeah. There was a, kind oh, of a cash see. flow moment where we had to basically get the money in to get it out, and then they paid us back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, you know, in you know, that's the first you time you wouldn't have that, done that all publicly, but it was all above board, and it was yeah. all you know. There, it's true that the sponsor came in and took us over the line, but they paid like the the, the minority mm-hmm. of our Kickstarter funding uh, compared to the lion's share that the listeners provided. You know mm-hmm. that that last few days, obviously, as we realised that we needed to get there, people were really care really cared about, it, and that mm-hmm. and that kind of uh, last plea on episode five yeah. was kind of like mm-hmm. you know the make or break mm. people started to pick up in the same way that graph shot up in the first week you know it, it just it had another groundswell and it got us I, I can't remember how far it got us but it, like it got us to a point where the sponsor's money would take us over the edge and that was just a great moment but it needed that fear it needed all of that the, the initial momentum the lull and then the uh the fear to get us over the line uh and that goes for me as it does the listeners you know the the actual pledges you think you'll still be doing the show five years from now? I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I uh, speak to many contributors who see this quite worryingly as their nest egg. Like they see it as their opportunity to speak to the industry for years to come. And that is a great thing. Uh, we, and we used to joke on the Guardian show about every year we do predictions for the, the year to come at Christmas yeah. uh, as a special while we were away. And there was always this, well, we'll see if we're here next year, uh, we'll see if that comes true. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, uh, hilariously, an one year joke. it was quite true. Yeah. But I don't feel that joke needs to happen anymore. I feel like we've, that's happened. We've, we suffered that little blip, but, you know, we got over it and now we're, we're here to stay. And better than ever. Um, I'm interested to know, actually, as a bit of a tangent, um, podcasting, of course, is, you're experiencing something of a, you know, a renaissance, if you can call it that, after only a decade or so. But in the States in particular, uh, the show last year, Serial, was enormous. I just would love to know what you thought of that. Yeah, uh, it was enormous. And um, I think uh, a few things kind of contributed to its success. I think partly, in fact, mostly, it was just a really captivating story. They took a very traditional concept, the Serial, and uh, they applied it to a podcast. Um, But also, I think This American Life, the producers were bang on the money in terms of they knew 
uh, that uh, there were innovations happening in podcasting, which the first 10 years were always a bit of a stumbling block. So uh, they knew that Apple had uh, decided to pre-install the podcast app onto new versions of iOS, uh, which meant that more people had access to at least knowing, well, pressing the button and wondering what it does, as opposed to, Mm. you know, sort of not knowing what a podcast is. At least they can investigate that for themselves as no one else was cheerleading for it. Um, And now with the hope that, uh, you know, uh, CarPlay, for example, Apple's new uh, sort of wireless system for cars, uh, and the other kind of Bluetooth innovations have kind of got it to a point where, you know, you're, you're not having to download via desktop. I think they knew that the, there was no better time. I mean, This American Life, who produce Serial, are a public radio institution. You know, they've been going almost 20 years. They produce these really high-quality stories that, at the rate of which the, the BBC, you know, is, is in awe of. You know, they... They research all these stories. They dismiss so many. They record so many, and then they dismiss them. So much material doesn't end up on air compared to BBC, mm. where it'd be a waste of license fee, payers' money, mm. um, and probably quite rightly. Mm. But they they produce those things, and so they were also getting content from podcast producers in the states. You know, they'd be say someone would produce a high quality podcast and send it to This American Life, and they go, "That's really interesting and really well made. We'll include this as part of our hour long show." And then they must have realized at some point, hey, we could do a separate podcast for one of our stories that just can't fit into an hour mm. or into two hours. Mm. We could extend it to like 12 hours of storytelling. And that's kind of what they did. I'm curious, what for you makes a good radio show? I think, yeah, it's, it's stories. It has to be stories. Mm. I mean, the, the medium audio is, is all about putting an idea into your head, a visual image. And the best way to do that is, is uh, through narrative, is through storytelling. Is that just the old-fashioned kind mm. of thing that we've always done before theatre, before any of those like, technical inv- innovations in, in art history. It's just about beginning, middle, end, and you get swept up into it. And I will guarantee anyone listening to this, it will be the, the bits where we've gone into proper stories where you can imagine being me in a situation yes. that will stick with you. Yes. Um, and that's the only thing you can do, really. So put us in the room. You've your successful campaign. The, the gang gets together, you and your, your colleagues. How do you celebrate? I was on a train. I was on a train up to my hometown in the Midlands in Worcestershire. And so um, I had this conversation over the, over the uh, uh, phone in, a, in, a, like in the vestibule, very noisy vestibule. In the, it was a beautiful summer's day. I was just on the phone to Pete. He was, he'd had the conversation with the uh, sponsor. He put the money in, in, you know, sort of uh, in trust that they would pay us back. And then we just let the seconds tick away until it happened. And it was a beautiful feeling. It was, a, and, and especially kind of having, and leaving London as well, kind of on a beautiful summer's day leaving London, kind of leaving that kind of like, uh, like intensity behind for a weekend and knowing it, that everything was going to be okay. Um, and, this, and also that kind of brand new adventure that when I, when I returned to London, you know, right, roll your sleeves up, we've got a podcast to produce. <laughs> which is not if we make a Hollywood movie yeah. this, by the way the that's guy, not the last line we'll use no, that's, we've got a podcast that's the trailer <laughs> gentlemen the, the, gun, the gunslinger is going to make a podcast yeah, exactly. yeah. hey tough guy yeah. Let's see your your podcast. Yeah. okay we're going to take one last short break um, and when we come back we're going to hear Matt Hill three tips or more three is it three? sure let's say three maybe there's ten <laughs> crowdfunding tips there's not 10 there's not 10 <laughs> when we come back from the break uh, tips from Matt Hill hey everybody a quick break to encourage you to sign up to our podcast at iTunes to stay informed about the show and our upcoming guests please sign up to our newsletter at kickstars.net to follow us on Twitter we are at kickstars show so Matt we've asked you to come up and uh, give us three top tips for crowdfunding success so what have you got for us so point number one uh, make sure your video matches the kind of content you're going to make. So if you're making something uh, which is homemade, then the video can be homemade uh, and cute like your product. But if you're making something which is uh, for a particular audience with a, with a slickness, you need to make something which fits that, even if it's... And that means maybe you have to get in a professional 
uh, in some respect uh, to make that happen. Or maybe you have friends that can do that for you, but you need to have the same sheen on your visuals that kind of evoke the style of the thing you're going to try and produce. Um, and that's why we pulled ours. That's why we, our video did not match up at the time to the, to the audio. And I <laughs> wanted to make sure that we were only doing quality stuff. So number two, creative contributions. I think um, if you can find ways of getting uh, pledges to donate, not just money, but something of themselves, their personality into your project uh, in the way that they share the campaign, in the way that they interact with your product, if they can have some sort of input, some sort of fingerprint on what they're making, they will feel so much more invested. Uh, Not in a... I've given you this, so I demand this back in return. But we're creating something together. And that is, I think, the main relationship you need to have with your pledges. Mm -hmm. You're creating something together. And then number three, if you can produce something alongside your campaign, off-site, then go on-site, then I think you're, you're forcing yourself into creating a narrative which will help the campaign. So... We, we'd never done a kind of, I'd never done a successful crowdfunding campaign before, but I knew how to make podcasts. And uh, by creating that six week trial of the, of the product alongside the, uh, the, the campaign, people knew roughly what they get in the long term. And it meant that at the same time as that, we could monitor the success of the, the, the kind of the, the campaign and also ramp up the threats mm-hmm. as well in mm-hmm. such a way that people felt like, right, we, you know, I've listened for three weeks. I realized that we're coming towards the end. I actually quite like this after all. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't really want it to end. So that all of those things that, you know, the having something that runs concurrently, something that comes out, some sort of update, it might, it might even just be like a, a JPEG that you're sharing on, tweet, on Twitter or whatever. But it's just got to be something which um, you're producing every week that adds to the story, builds and pushes it along. So creating something outside of Kickstarter which can run alongside it and feed into it, that is just as, just as uh, you know, you don't have to think within that, those, that small confine of what Kickstarter asks you to do. You can do more than that. Okay, so your, your top tips are that, uh, number one, the video is important and it's got to be on brand, got to totally match the quality of the, of the thing that you're offering. Uh, number two, creative contributions uh, encourage sharing and input and get people invested in, in what you're pitching. And number three, produce something uh, away from the campaign, like a trial version of the product, really. Show them the quality and use that to build the audience. You see, the, the producer in me wants some like blind date style music. Yes. Yeah. We'll leave right. this. That recap yeah. was excellent. Thank you. <laughs> nice recap. Live as well. So did we it, got an award live. from Matt uh, that we got to work up and there's some sort of certificate for Pete's recap. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just going to recap these recaps very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the very last thing on our list here is what guest we call picks. guest picks. Well, no surprises for anyone that listens to podcasts that I'm about to pick Roman Mars and his oh. three very successful Kickstarter campaigns. Uh, he's the guy that really kicked all of this off uh, in terms of getting listener donations through Kickstarter. Uh, most successful podcast to be uh, funded. Uh, it started with his own 99% Invisible, which he started from scratch uh, as a podcast. I think he started to syndicate it on uh, public radio but uh, got these listener contributions through Kickstarter. I think his first campaign was for season three, and he, he raised a, a staggering, at the time, 170000 That was like just the beginning. Um, he, he used that money to kind of instill a kind of, a kind of ethic in what they created, not just in terms of the high, the high quality of the sound and the stories that he was creating in his podcast. It's a, it's a program about architecture and design. Yes, yeah. It's about design. Mm-hmm. What's his secret? What makes his campaign so successful? Well, if I knew that, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think, you know... He had a video, didn't he? He did have right. a video. <laughs> I think that's probably the difference. Uh, that's the difference. He, okay. I think... So I have met him, and uh, we've spoken about this, and he's, he, he was the one that told me about that, that 2%. Uh, and so, so there's a few things that you can... The 2% of that. the audience... 2% of the audience pledging. that, that, that had uh, pledged yeah. and pledged well. Real inspiration. He's kind of... I mean, you know, he isn't Roman is 
in danger of making it look too easy. <laughs> uh, and I'm here to tell you it is not. Yeah. But it is uh, certainly an inspiration to a lot of people that it doesn't have to be about commercial sales. Mm-hmm. You know, you can, there are other ways of funding podcasts. You can win your independence. Yeah. yeah. I'm also intrigued by uh, someone whose name is Roman Mars. In my experience, people are called things like Steve or Tony or Bob. Or this Peel. is... This is why this is no what pre success. Roman, Roman Mars, Mars. Is Dirk that, Mags. What, These are just great names. Unbelievable names. names. Great it's, names. It doesn't even sound human. Yeah, it's but very, they make you think it's, twice. It's an epic they? name. The, the simplest thing though is just to reverse flip the name. So Hill Matt, Dean Pete, well, Mars Roman. It's still it's still off the charts. Crazy Mars it's, Roman. Oh. I mean, it's great. <laughs> it's lovely. It works yeah. both ways. Yeah. yeah, but it's a great name. When you met Roman, did he have any advice for you? Well, we met after my campaign had finished, so that wasn't necessarily uh, on the cards. I mean, he he opened up for me the uh, the very real nature of doing one of these campaigns. You know, the the fact that so few people will donate compared to who will do whatever. You know, mm-hmm. who would buy the product or mm-hmm. you know listen to the program or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's all about reaching all of them. Mm-hmm. To get to those few right and that is the real trick and if you can get that right then and i used to i used to do theater and we we would take a show up to edinburgh and you would spend the hours around your show out on the royal mile like handing out leaflets you you'd take up for some reason the more leaflets you bought the cheaper it got so you'd have <laughs> ridiculous amounts of leaflets ten thousand leaflets to hand out over two weeks or three weeks or whatever and, you know, you knew as you were handing them out that none of these people were going to go and see your show. Yeah. Except the reality was like one in a hundred, one, yeah. two in a hundred. Yeah. So you just knew you just had to keep getting those leaflets out. And eventually, you, you know, once you'd got through four or five hundred, you knew that five or six people and their friends might turn up. And that's, that's all you can hope for. And so, they make all the difference. So aim big. I think that's the only thing I can really take from it is that, you know, and, you know, the States is a big country. People are thinking coast to coast yeah. in a way which I think we have in Britain a kind of just a, a, an island personality. We think within our borders yeah. and we're quite, you know, we don't think big enough. And I think that is just a geographical thing. And we can now at the age of the Internet, we can we can start to open up. We can think about ourselves as global players and really kind of like expand. I think and That definitely applies to the world of crowdfunding. Which yeah. is, by its nature, international. Yeah, absolutely. So the guest pick this week is Roman Mars, Radiotopia. Yeah, absolutely. Are there words to live by? Something that you've got, you know, a piece of paper that's on your desk or stuck to the wall that you look to that you can leave us with? Uh, the thing I stand by most of all is everybody's faking it. I think that's probably the thing I fall back on the most. Uh, it does, it just... Whenever you go into a new situation, you just got to remember that everyone else is exactly the same position and no one's ever as prepared as you think they are. Yeah. And you should really lean on that for help. <laughs> yes. <you know. laughs> well, if you're it. faking it, you're doing a great job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and thanks so much, Matt, for being a, a great guest. It's been wonderful having you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you, Matt. You. Thank you for all your time, your good insights, and, and we wish you continued success with the media podcast keep listening the media podcast.com nice one until next week thanks for listening bye-bye if you'd like to be a guest on kickstars and share your story of crowdfunding success then write to us by email at hello at kickstars.net with your name and a link to your campaign page our thanks to the very talented songwriter Kim Bookbinder for the Kickstars theme music. For more on Kim, do check out kimbookbinder.com. Thanks for listening. Kickstars, gonna kick it with Pete and Mike. Kickstars, interviews behind the high. Kickstars. Go your way
that's why I call epic.